Thanks for joining. So I'm very excited to talk about our work on education attainment and on schizophrenia. And this is joint work between my group in Amsterdam and some other colleagues in Amsterdam and the research group of Hannelore Ehrenreich at the Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine in Göttingen. And Stefan Ripke from the Broad helped us out with the uh, summary statistics for schizophrenia. Um, so the, the general idea um, in this project is that we may actually learn something new about schizophrenia by borrowing information from a genetically uh, related trait, in this case, education attainment. And in particular, I will show you one relatively simple way how we can test for genetic heterogeneity among schizophrenia symptoms using these two sets of GWAS summary statistics and a holdout sample that has very detailed schizophrenia phenotypes. And this is actually just an illustration of a more general idea. So we can actually learn something about latent traits or endophenotypes that cannot be observed yet in large GWAS samples by combining GWAS summary statistics of genetically related traits that are observed in large samples. So that's the underlying idea. Um, and just as a fair warning, uh, throughout my talk, I'm just going to assume that uh, everyone is familiar with some basics in statistical genetics. So in particular, I will assume that you guys know what a genomic association study or GWAS is and what is uh, linkage disequilibrium or LD. And if you don't know, then I would just recommend that you quickly Google that before you continue following this presentation. So the, um, let me see, ah, yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the paper that I'm talking about is actually available as a preprint on bioarchives. We're planning to update this paper uh, in the next few weeks, and then hopefully soon after that, it will also be uh, published as a proper article. Um, and there are actually several goals that we uh, try to achieve in this, uh, in this project, and they all sort of belong to this, uh, to this general idea that, that we can learn something about a trait by borrowing uh, information from a genetically related trait. So what we're doing here is, first of all, we're trying to identify additional loci that are associated with schizophrenia by using education attainment as a proxy phenotype. And we're also going to try to improve the polygenic predictive accuracy of schizophrenia, and importantly also of schizophrenia symptoms. And we will test for genetic heterogeneity among schizophrenia symptoms. And then finally, we will try to clarify the genetic relationship between schizophrenia on the one hand and bipolar disorder on the other hand with respect to education and IQ. And this latter set of um, analysis will actually relate to a, to a recent debate about whether we should uh, think of schizophrenia as a neurodevelopmental disorder or not. Um, so as a background, the, uh, uh, so the evidence suggests that both schizophrenia and education are partially heritable traits. Schizophrenia is, of course, much more heritable than education, but both traits are what we call genetically complex traits, which means that the heritability of these two outcomes is not the result of just a few genes with large effects, but it's rather hundreds, if not thousands of genes that all have a tiny influence on the outcome that contribute to this um, heritability. For both of these traits, we have relatively large-scale uh, GWAS results available, and there has been some progress in identifying specific genetic loci that are linked to both of them. So um, for schizophrenia, uh, there was the paper by the uh, PGC in Nature 2014, which reported 108 independent loci that are associated with schizophrenia. Our group had a paper in Nature last year that reported 74 independent loci associated with EA. However, these loci only capture a very small part of the uh, uh, heritability of these traits, and it's, uh, it's clear that the vast majority of the loci that are responsible for this heritability haven't been uh, discovered or identified. What is also clear at this point is that at least education attainment seems to be what I would like to call a genetically heterogeneous outcome. So with that, I mean that we can decompose education into 
endophenotypes that do not seem to have uh, the same genetic architecture. So in particular, we had an analysis in our um, nature paper. It's basically, it's a mediation analysis where we show that the uh, influence of the polygenic score on years of schooling is actually mediated by several endophenotypes. Um, so primarily, uh, the mediation uh, went through IQ, but partly it was also mediated by other factors uh, such as openness to experience and behavioral inhibition. And these endophenotypes actually do not have the same genetic architecture. Um, another interesting thing is that the polygenic score for schizophrenia uh, does a reasonably good job in predicting case control status. So depending on which prediction sample you choose, this polygenic score captures four to roughly 15% uh, of the liability to schizophrenia. But interestingly, this polygenic score does not predict any of the schizophrenia symptoms or disease severity. So this raises uh, the question why it is that the polygenic score actually doesn't do that. So one reason could be that the GEO sample for schizophrenia is simply uh, too small yet. That's certainly part of the answer. But another reason why we see that could be uh, that maybe uh, schizophrenia is also a genetically heterogeneous trait, meaning that maybe uh, the uh, schizophrenia diagnosis is aggregating over several symptoms that have different genetic architectures and uh, therefore different biological pathways that, uh, that cause these symptoms. So if that's the case, that may actually have implications for how we think about the disease, how we should uh, diagnose it, how we should um, differentiate between this diagnosis and others, and ultimately it may even have implications for treatment. So this seems to be a pretty important question. So one thing that we could do to get a grip on that would be to just run GWAS analysis on these specific traits or on symptom severity directly. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't work yet because there's only a very few data sets in the world that have collected uh, these high accuracy symptoms and severity phenotypes for people that are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And the available sample sizes are simply, you know, basically orders of magnitudes too small for us to just run GWAS on that directly. So we can't do that, but what we can do, uh, and what I will show you is that we can make a little progress by borrowing information from a genetically dependent trait. So in this case, we're going to look at uh, education attainment. And the reason for looking at education is basically twofold. So first, education is currently uh, the largest GWAS uh, sample for any cognitive trait. Uh, so uh, the latest GWAS that we have um, currently in the pipeline actually has uh, more than a million observations. And the one that I'm using in this analysis already has over 3, uh, 300,000. So that means that compared to many other genetically related traits, we, uh, we will actually work with DO summary statistics that have uh, reasonable statistical power in our analysis. And then second, education and schizophrenia seem to be related in interesting ways. So if you just look at the phenotypic level, it seems like that there is a negative relationship between educational attainment and schizophrenia. So in particular, people that are diagnosed with schizophrenia, they often drop out of school early. And among those that are diagnosed with schizophrenia, you often see um, a correlation between uh, low educational achievement and earlier age of onset, more severe symptoms and worse prognosis. And some people have recently argued very forcefully that uh, cognitive deficits during early development and bad performance in school should be seen as the differentiating factor between schizophrenia on the one hand and bipolar disorder on the other hand. So this relates actually to the, to the original uh, idea of, uh, of Preplin or the description of uh, dementia precox. Now, if you look at the genetic side of the picture, it turns out that education and schizophrenia have a significant but slightly positive genetic correlation. And that seems to be a bit of a puzzle. And it seems to suggest that uh, we may be able to learn something about genetic heterogeneity and schizophrenia by exploiting the results from education a bit further. So um, before I go further, let me just be absolutely crystal clear in terms of the terminology I will be using. So when I say genetic dependence, I basically mean that two traits share more genetic loci than expected by chance. Uh, 
And when I say genetic correlation, I refer to the correlation of the true effect sizes of these genetic loci on uh, both traits. So genetic correlation implies a linear relationship, whereas genetic dependence uh, does not imply linear. It could be anything. So therefore, the two traits could be genetically dependent, although they're not genetically correlated and vice versa. There are several reasons why you may end up with two traits that are uh, that have a nonlinear genetic dependence. Um, one of them is that there may be a genetic heterogeneity in at least one of these traits. And with heterogeneity, again, I mean that the trait can be decomposed into endophenotypes that have imperfect or actually no genetic correlation with each other. And then other reasons include linkage disequilibrium, um, but you may also see an enrichment or the genetic dependence due to a very strong assortative mating uh, that happens, that may even happen completely independently on both of these traits. So while we're interpreting the, the data, we will need to keep these different explanations in, in mind and we will need to check uh, which of them is actually applicable. So the data um, we're using is basically the GWAS results from education attainment from our nature paper. So we, we take the discovery cohorts and meta-analyze it with the uh, uh, replication cohort, the UK Biobank. And before we do that, we have excluded all the samples that have uh, contributed to the 2014 GWAS on schizophrenia, so that we end up with uh, two non-overlapping GWAS samples. For schizophrenia, we take the 2014 results and we take out yet another cohort, the, da the GRAS data collection, and the GRAS data collection will be used as our replication sample. And uh, the great thing about the GRAS data collection is that they're one of the few samples in the world that have really, um, uh, that have collected highly detailed, harmonized measures of schizophrenia symptoms and health history records for the schizophrenia patients. So this is an ideal sample for, for what we have in mind. And then we just work with the roughly 8 million autosomal SNPs that pass quality control in, B, uh, in both GWAS analysis and that have uh, that were available in the, in the majority of the samples that were meta analyzed. So as a first thing, uh, I'm showing you here a plot of the uh, Z statistics uh, for both of these traits. So we, uh, we just plotted the Z statistics for education attainment on the X axis and the Z-statistics for schizophrenia on the Y-axis. And we've indicated genomoid significance with the red line. So basically everything that is left of this red line and right of this red line is genomoid significant for education. And everything that's below this red line and above this red line is genomoid significant for schizophrenia. So just eyeballing this, um, this picture, you see that obviously there is a bunch of loci that are already genomic significant for both of these traits. But you also see that there are some loci that are jointly genomic significant for these two traits. So some of them, they're laying here on the diagonal of the picture. And we're going to call these SNPs uh, sign concordant, meaning that the allele that is increasing the risk for schizophrenia also increases the chance to go to college or to have a higher educational attainment. And we also have some loci that are here on the off diagonal. So these are SNPs that we will call discordant. So here, the allele that increases the chance to have schizophrenia actually decreases the chance to go to college or have higher educational attainment. So this is interesting. So just looking at this, it looks like that uh, there, there seems to be you know, a bit more um, uh, genetic overlap between these two traits than expected by chance. And I will show you a formal test for that in a few minutes. But it seems like that this genetic dependence between the two traits does not follow a strict linear pattern. So that's just eyeballing the, the sum stats. Um, Okay, so the first thing that we did to actually dig into this data a bit deeper is what we call a proxy phenotype analysis. So we, uh, we followed the pre-specified analysis plan for this that also laid out our replication strategy and that had the power calculations for the replication stage and so on and so forth. And what we're basically doing is we, we start out with the, uh, the low side that are most strongly associated with education. And then we forward that set of SNPs and tested in our independent sample uh, of GWAS summary statistics for schizophrenia. And we only test this subset of SNPs. So in particular, we basically select all SNPs that are 
um, associated with education at a threshold of uh, 10 to the power of minus 5 or lower, then we LD prune all these SNPs, and we end up with 506 education-associated lead SNPs. And then we look up the p-value for schizophrenia for only these 506 SNPs in our independent schizophrenia sample. And that means that uh, in contrast to just running a GWAS, we uh, are not testing a million independent hypotheses, we're only testing 506. So our multiple testing correction doesn't have to be as stringent, and that basically results in a, in a gain in, uh, in statistical power. Um, and as a formal enrichment test, we're going to do the following. So the question is going to be, are the education-associated SNPs more associated with schizophrenia than you would expect by chance, given the distribution of the p-values of all these SNPs for schizophrenia? And in order to test that, we basically we take our 506 EA-associated lead SNPs, and for each of them, we randomly draw 10 additional SNPs that have exactly the same minor allele frequency, and we look up the the p-value of these 10 additional SNPs for, uh, for schizophrenia as well. We're making sure that the uh, you know, randomly drawn SNPs, that they're LD independent from each other and also from the original EA lead SNP. And that gives us basically two sets of p-values, one that comes from the set of SNPs that are EA associated and the other one are just randomly drawn uh, with the same minor relief frequency distribution. And then we can basically compare the rank order of the p-values in these two sets using a man whitney u test. And that's going to be our formal test for uh, enrichment. And let me show you the Manhattan plot that we have for education attainment. So in our GWAS from uh, roughly 360,000 individuals, we now have 108 loci that are genomite significant for education. Uh, at the pre-selected p-value threshold of 10 to the power minus 5, we have 506 loci, as I said, and among these 506, 132 are nominally significant for schizophrenia, and we indicated them here with a red cross. And 21 are actually um, significantly associated with schizophrenia after Bonferroni correction, and we're marking those with a green cross. And you see that the, uh, the schizophrenia-associated loci, they're basically uh, distributed also across the entire genome, so this is not just uh, focused on one particular uh, location. So this becomes even more clear in terms of enrichment when you look at the QQ plot. So here we show you the, uh, uh, the observed distribution of the p-values of our 506 EA-associated lead SNPs with schizophrenia against the uh, uh, expected distribution under the null. And all the SNPs that are above this gray shaded region here, so basically all these, they are the ones that are significant after Bonferroni correction. And you clearly see that there is a strong lift off, early lift off here. So um, the QQ plots clearly seems to suggest that this is more strongly associated than expected by chance. And this is also what our enrichment p value from the test that I just described to you tells us. So we can basically reject the null of just random enrichment with a p-value of smaller than 10 to the power of minus 10. However, if you look at the sign concordance of these SNPs, um, we've marked them with blue and with pink, or uh, the pink ones are the ones that have concordant effects on the two traits, and the blue ones are ones that have discordant effects. The sign concordance seems to be split basically half-half, which is what you would expect by chance, right? So. Um, it looks like that we have two traits that are uh, genetically dependent, uh, but that do not have a strictly linear relationship. Okay, so let's look a little bit further at these 21 SNPs that survived Bonferroni correction. So 14 of them, they were already genomite significant in the study uh, by uh, Lipke et al. Uh, so that led, uh, left that with, uh, with seven SNPs that we thought are novel, but by the time we had these results, uh, a new, even larger GWAS on schizophrenia came out by Pardinas et al. on BioArchives. And it turns out that some of the novel genomite significant hits that they report there were also in our set of, uh, of our proxy phenotype results. So in particular, three variants that we found uh, actually also turn out to be a genomite significant in the, in the larger Pardinas et al. study. And we actually have a small section in our paper where we show that using education attainment as a proxy phenotype helped us to 
predicts these novel GWAS findings and that even larger GWAS sample by Pydenas et al. So it's sort of like you could take the results for education attainment sort of like as a glimpse into the future of schizophrenia research, although the education hits are not going to tell you anything about the direction of the effect that these SNPs are going to have. Um, so two of the SNPs that we found, they were previously reported by Leherat et al. Um, they, uh, they also did, uh, they, they worked with the EA summary statistics. They did something similar to the proxy phenotype approach, but they used a, a smaller overlapping sample. And that left us with uh, two potentially novel variants. Uh, one is on chromosome 13 uh, in the SL1 uh, TRT1 gene. And uh, that's actually a gene that's highly expressed in the brain and that is uh, particularly localized to uh, excitatory synapses and promoting their development. And it has actually been previously suggested to be a candidate gene for neuropsychiatric disorders. The other locus we identify is on chromosome uh, 1, and uh, it's linked to the FOXO6 gene, which is predominantly expressed in the hippocampus and has been suggested to be involved in memory, consolidation, emotion, and synaptic function. Now, one question is whether the, uh, the enrichment we see is entirely explained by linkage disequilibrium patterns or if we're tabbing into a specific loci that actually have direct pleiotropic effects on both of these traits. So one of the things that we did to check that was uh, we used Painter to, to try to tease out what is what. And the way we did that is basically for each of the SNPs that were isolated by our proxy phenotype analysis, we looked at their neighboring SNPs within a 500 kb window and estimated their posterior probability of being causal either for EA or for schizophrenia using the painter tool. And then we selected two sets of SNPs, each of which contains the smallest number of SNPs which yields the cumulative posterior probability of 90% of containing the causal locus for EA and for schizophrenia respectively. And then finally for these sets, we calculated the posterior probability for the overlapping set that it contains the causal locus for both of these traits. And then we classify the probability of a locus being pleiotropic as low if the overlap is smaller than 50%, uh, medium if it's 15 to 45, and high if it's 45 or higher. And using this criteria, we, uh, we estimate that eight of the 21 loci that are um significant are likely to have a direct pleiotropic effect on both of these traits. And from these eight, five, again, they have a concordant effect, and three have discordant effects. So pushing this bioannotation a little bit further, uh, we uh, ran the PICT on the 132 SNPs that are jointly associated with education and with uh, schizophrenia. And that led to 111 significant reconstituted gene sets. And then pruning these gene sets resulted in 19 representative gene sets, including terms like dendrites, axon guidance, transmission across chemical synapses, and abnormal cerebral cortex morphology. And all significantly enriched tissues uh, were related to the nervous system and to the sense or organs, and furthermore, neural stem cells were the only significantly enriched cell type. So, a uh, high-level summary is that the bioannotation of the set of SNPs that are jointly associated with both traits seems to point to early-stage neurodevelopment and things that may go wrong during that process. So let's push this question a bit further if the enrichment we see is due to LD or not. And for that, we uh, developed a, a so-called LD-aware enrichment test. And we're using for that basically uh, the, the insights from LD score regression and the LD scores for SNPs uh, from the HubMap3 reference panel. And in particular, um, as has been shown in the LD score paper, you can calculate the expected chi square of a particular SNP i for trait j as a function of the GWAS sample size that you had available for trait j. The SNP-based heritability of trait J, and the particular LD score of SNP I, conditional on the number of SNPs that you included in the calculation uh, of your LD score. And then there is this residual term here, which is basically the intercept from the LD score regression, uh, which captures increases in the expected association statistic due to stratification.
So then we can basically calculate for each of our um, SNPs that we identified the, um, the expected chi-square given the LD score of that SNP and compare it to the observed chi-square. And uh, based on that ratio, we can now construct a test statistic, which allows us to test if the enrichment that we observe is entirely due to LD or not. And when we carry out that test for the 105 SNPs that are jointly associated with education and schizophrenia, and for which we also had LD scores from HubMap3, it turns out that we can reject the null hypothesis that the enrichment is entirely caused by LD patterns uh, with a p-value of 10 to the power uh, minus 14. So when we basically did the same LD-aware enrichment test across 21 other trades, and the question here was, do we see this enrichment of these education-associated SNPs because they tell us maybe something about schizophrenia or something about the brain in general, or are these simply SNPs or low side that basically pop up for any trade that you would want to look at, right? So the question was just how much phenotype specificity is in these results? So uh, we, uh, we selected a number of other traits for which we had GWAS summary statistics available in the public domain. So we looked at other brain traits such as bipolar disorder, ADHD, Alzheimer's, autism, depression, neuroticism, well-being, uh, intracranial volume, and childhood intelligence. Then we looked at some traits that were not obviously related to, uh, uh, so to schizophrenia, but they still may be. Uh, so there we had inflammatory bowel disease, cigarettes per day, BMI, height, age at menarche, age at menopause, and coronary artery disease. And then we had a number of control traits where we just didn't expect to see any uh, genetic dependence with schizophrenia at all. And the control traits were fasting insulin, fasting pro-insulin, birth weight, and birth weight uh, length. So we tested all 132 SNPs that are jointly significant for education and for schizophrenia, uh, and for which, or for which we had um, uh, highly LD-linked proxies available in these summary statistics. And the result is as follows. So we actually see LD-aware enrichment for bipolar disorder, for inflammatory bowel disease, for neuroticism, age at menarche, and childhood intelligence, but we don't see LD-aware enrichment for our control traits, and also not for other um, brain traits, such as major depressive disorder, depressive symptoms, or subjective well-being. And note that actually for some of these uh, traits for which we see no enrichment, they actually had much, much larger GWAS samples than some of the traits for which we do see enrichment, which may suggest that uh, indeed the, uh, the results that we have um, do have some phenotype specificity. Okay, so do these proxy phenotype results replicate out of sample? Um, the problem to answer that question is that any one of these SNPs actually only has a very, very tiny effect on, the, uh, uh, on schizophrenia. So the largest effect size that we found um, had a uh, odds ratio of 1.1. That was uh, after winner's curse correction. And uh, we already knew that ex ante. So in our power calculations, we, uh, we decided uh, that in order to replicate these results, we would have to use a polygenic score that contains at least 80 of the most strongly associated independent SNPs so that we would have at least 90% power at the 5% level in our holdout sample. And what we did then in practice is that we constructed a polygenic score uh, based on the 132 SNPs that are jointly associated with uh, education and schizophrenia. And then we use the beta coefficients for schizophrenia as our weights in the score. And we call that score schizophrenia 132. So let's see how that score does in our holdout sample. So if we just run a regression of case control status in the grass sample on the 132 score, it is uh, highly significantly associated with case control status and it captures about 1.3% on the liability scale to schizophrenia. We compare that to the overall schizophrenia score, which is even more strongly associated, not surprisingly, and captures around 7% on the liability scale. Now, interestingly, the 132 score remains statistically significant in a joint model that also controls for the schizophrenia score, and we boost predictive accuracy compared to the normal schizophrenia score by about half a percent. And the score even remains uh, significant if we include additional polygenic scores as control. So we, uh, if you put the education scores in there, but also a bipolar score and a Rotterdam score, even under these conditions, 
does the score remain predictive by itself? And overall, we capture roughly 9% of the variation on the liability scale. Um, so now let's turn to this idea of testing for genetic heterogeneity among schizophrenia symptoms. So um, in general, you can use GWAS summary statistics on genetically dependent traits to identify uh, partially the genetic architecture of latent traits, and you may use it to test for heterogeneity in observed traits. And let, just, uh, let me just illustrate this idea with a very, very simple, completely hypothetical example. So let's assume you have two observed genetically dependent traits for which you have large GWAS scale, uh, large scale GWAS summary statistics available from independent samples. So let's say it's uh, education and schizophrenia. Let's assume you also have two unobserved endophenotypes that influence both of these observed traits, and let's call them IQ and openness. And let's assume that you have a holdout sample with good measures of these endophenotypes. And then finally assume that the observed traits are just a function of the unobserved ones, such that education is simply openness plus IQ and schizophrenia is openness minus IQ. Now, um, if you would be able to, uh, uh, to get large-scale GWAS summary statistics for IQ and for openness, for our latent traits, you could plot them against each other. And what you would see is that uh, the... Uh, uh, so if you put the IQ results on the y-axis and the openness results on the, uh, on the x-axis, what you would see is that the SNPs that are laying here on the off-diagonal, they would be the ones that, are, uh, you know, that, that would be expected to be associated with schizophrenia. And the ones that are laying on the diagonal, they would be the ones that you would, be expect, uh, that you would expect to be uh, associated with education. So you can't do that because you don't have these large-scale results, but what you can do is the following. You can look at the observed Z statistics uh, for schizophrenia and for education directly. And actually, I showed you this picture earlier. And if you now plot these SNPs against each other, you should find that SNPs that are laying here on the diagonal, they should be the ones that are associated. So the concordant ones should be the ones that are associated with openness. And the ones that are laying here on the off diagonal, the discordant ones, they should be the ones that are associated with IQ. So you should now be able to construct a polygenic score that just uses uh, uh, basically the information on sign concordance. And you, should, uh, you could construct a, a discordant and a concordant score. And then you could take it to your holdout sample. Uh, and, you could, uh, and you should be able to see that the discordant score predicts IQ and the concordant score predicts open. And in this very simple model, schizophrenia and education uh, would actually look like two genetically dependent traits uh, that don't have a clear pattern of sign concordance. All right, so um, we can push this idea a little bit further, and uh, we can actually use that to, to construct the formal test of genetic heterogeneity and schizophrenia symptoms. And here's how this will work. So in general, um, you can, you know, if you want to do prediction of education, schizophrenia, and endophenotypes in a holdout sample using polygenic scores, then it should be true that adding scores uh, from genetically correlated traits should improve the predictive accuracy of your prediction equation. So it should improve R square. If your target trait, schizophrenia, is genetically heterogeneous, then the polygenic score from education may also improve the prediction of your endophenotypes or symptoms, but crucially, there is additional information now in how each SNP influences both of these, uh, 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 these endophenotypes or symptoms. So uh, what we're going to do is just the most simple way possible. So we're just going to split the sp uh, this, uh, schizophrenia score into two scores based on their sign concordance of the SNPs um, for schizophrenia and education. So the overall score is composed of uh, roughly 520,000 LD pruned SNPs. And we're going to pull them apart into a concordant score that only has SNPs with plus plus or minus minus effect, and that's about 260,000. And the remainders, uh, which is almost the same number, goes into the discordant score. We really just split it into two halves. Now, once the prediction model of these symptoms controls for the education score, splitting the schizophrenia score by sign concordance with education is actually not expected to improve the predictive accuracy of these symptoms unless they are genetically heterogeneous. And that's the underlying idea of our statistical test. So 
even more formally, we're going to um, do the test as follows. We have a baseline prediction model where we regress the symptom on the EA score and the schizophrenia score. And then we have a, um, a second prediction model where we just split the sp schizophrenia score into concordant and discordant scores. Um, and then we just compare the model fit uh, using the F statistic. And the, uh, the null hypothesis now is that uh, schizophrenia is a genetically homogenous trait where uh, the symptoms have identical genetic architectures. And in that case, splitting the schizophrenia score by sign concordance actually shouldn't improve model fit. So that's going to be the test. Now, we're going to do that in the grass sample, which has these, uh, these phenomenal phenotypes on the schizophrenia patients. And um, we're going to look at uh, a number of phenotypes for these schizophrenia patients. So we're looking at age at prodrome, age at disease onset, pre-morbid IQ, um, global assessment of functioning, where a low score will mean poor functioning, and uh, the clinical global impression of severity scale, where a high score means more severe function, uh, more severe symptoms. And then we look at positive and negative syndromes using the PUNS positive and negative sum scores. Um, so we're predicting these, uh, these phenotypes in the grass sample. Um, the first thing that I'm going to show you is the baseline results, where we basically re uh, regress these phenotypes on the normal schizophrenia score and the education score simultaneously. And what we see is that for years of education, age of prodrome, age of disease onset and pre-morbid IQ, the schizophrenia score doesn't predict any of these phenotypes. But the education score actually predicts years of education and pre-morbid IQ to some extent, maybe as you would expect. If you move on and we look at disease severity and symptoms, again, it turns out the schizophrenia score actually doesn't predict any of these phenotypes. And this is uh, basically what has been reported earlier. Whereas the education score actually predicts uh, global functioning. So a higher value on the education score is associated with slightly better uh, global functioning uh, among the schizophrenia patients. So that's the baseline model. Now what happens if we split the score? So for the first four phenotypes, basically nothing happens. So the predictive accuracy doesn't improve. Now, if we move to uh, symptoms and disease severity, we actually do see some action. So now it looks like that the, uh, uh, the polygenic scores, they can predict uh, global functioning and the negative symptoms somewhat better. And in particular, it looks like that SNPs that are positively associated with, uh, with education, they have a protective effect against negative symptoms and they lead to somewhat better global functioning. However, this protective effect seems to be attenuated if the SNP also increases the, uh, the uh, risk for schizophrenia. So then it would end up here in the concordance score. And this is why you have a negative coefficient here and a positive coefficient there. And um, actually, the results get even more dramatic if you include uh, discordant and concordant scores with slightly higher number of SNPs. So where we use a less conservative LD pruning algorithm and in that case, we basically see that there is uh, improvement in predictive accuracy across the board of the four uh, phenotypes that measure disease severity and symptoms. So clearly, the results seem to, uh, seem to suggest that there is genetic heterogeneity in these symptoms. Okay, and the final thing that I wanted to, uh, to show you is some analysis that, that further helps us to differentiate between uh, schizophrenia uh, and bipolar uh, disorder. And in particular, we're asking the question, so what is unique about the genetic architecture of schizophrenia versus bipolar? And for that, we're using so-called genome-wide inferred statistics, GWAS, and they allow us to purge the GWAS results for schizophrenia of their genetic correlation with bipolar. And that genetic correlation is actually pretty high, it's 0.7. And if we apply GWAS, we end up with uh, two sets of inferred BDAS and their standard errors. One is for what we will call unique schizophrenia minus bipolar, and the other one is for unique bipolar minus schizophrenia. And then we can basically look at the genetic correlation of these unique sets of summary statistics with education attainment, childhood IQ, and neuroticism. Now let's look at the results. Um, so the first thing you see is that if you just look at the, uh, um, a second, 
Do we see this? Yes. So if you just look at uh, the raw schizophrenia results, they turn out to be positively genetically correlated with bipolar, as we've seen before. And uh, they're also positively genetically correlated with education. Now, if you look at, if you look at the uh, inferred statistics, so if you look at unique schizophrenia, it turns out that unique schizophrenia actually has a negative genetic correlation uh, with, uh, with education attainment. And it also has um, a negative genetic correlation with childhood IQ, whereas the uh, results of bipolar suggest the positive genetic correlation with IQ and with, uh, um, with education attainment in both cases. So this really seems to be compatible with this idea that what's unique about schizophrenia is that it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, whereas uh, bipolar is clearly not. So the final robustness check was we, uh, we tried to see if the uh, enrichment pattern that we see in our results could be generated uh, through a very strong uh, sort of mating that happens independently for these two traits. So we, we did some simulation under very extreme assumptions. We let them run to for 50 generations and we actually didn't see any trend in the enrichment statistics, which suggests that it's very unlikely that uh, you know, the pattern that we observe is due to a sort of mating. Okay, and now we can wrap it up. Uh, so what we've seen is that these GWAS summary statistics for education attainment, they actually aid, uh, they can help us to, uh, to understand the genetic architecture uh, of schizophrenia a bit better. So the results clearly point to genetic heterogeneity among schizophrenia symptoms. Now for the first time, we've seen that schizophrenia symptoms and disease severity can be partially predicted from genetic data. And using education attainment as a proxy phenotype, we have identified two um, empirically plausible candidate loci for schizophrenia. And we've also seen that, uh, you know, that the education results sort of uh, help us to predict the future of uh, you know, GWAS results for, for schizophrenia. And then finally, uh, it turns out that the uh, small positive genetic correlation between education and schizophrenia can actually be entirely be explained by the uh, genetic similarity between schizophrenia and bipolar. And if you just look, look at the part that is unique to schizophrenia, that's actually negatively genetically associated with IQ and education attainment, um, which is you know, compatible with the idea of schizophrenia being a neurodevelopmental disorder. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it here. And uh, if you guys wanna get in touch, here are my contact details, and this is the link to the BioArchives paper. Thanks.